Because, you know, as, as someone once asked him, when did you come out of the closet? And Jimmy said, well, it's not that I came out of the closet. The closet just sort of dissolved all around me. I think it was in New York, uh, and probably in December, and probably 1970. And I say that because I was with uh, Ken Bleeth, my partner of 52 years now. Um, I was still in graduate school. We were having dinner with uh, our mutual friend, the late David Calstone, who was a dear friend of Merrill's. And I think we were all going out somewhere. And um, I had never seen anybody so, um, refined in my life and I was quite intimidated and Jimmy said in his what I think is now called Locust Valley Lockjaw voice which was compounded of equal parts Upper East Side and uh, Atlanta Georgia from his mother he said well who are the interesting people at Harvard now and I thought, well, I don't know any interesting people. I'm just a, I'm just a lowly graduate student. I have nothing to add. But he was very, um, he was very gentle and he was very inquisitive uh, and he wanted to know what was going on. And this was, I think, a function of his innate manners. He did not talk about himself. Uh, he asked about others. Whether he was really interested or not doesn't matter because he was bred to ask questions about other people and not talk about himself. He was sort of modest about it, and that's evident by the fact that his Pulitzer Prize and his National Book Awards, they're hanging up in the kitchen, you know, over, over the sink, essentially. It's not a trophy room. It's not, it's not a man's, you know, pride of place with, with uh, heads on the, on the, uh, the walls, you know, they're just there, it's part of his life. Um, the second thing I would say is that he knew, like many great artists, he knew from an early age that he had the goods. And so I don't think these things would surprise him or did surprise him at the time. But the third thing, which is sad, is that I can't remember whether it was the Pulitzer or one of the National Book Awards or the Bollingen Prize, he won at a time when there was a temporary breakup with his Greek lover, Strato. And he says this in, the, uh, in one of the letters. And this would have been in the 70s, I think. And he said, I would rather give the National Book Award back and have Strato instead. So this is interesting. Um, like many artists, uh, and I've known many, mostly writers, the last thing he ever wanted to talk about, especially with academics, was, was his poetry. You know, people would say, what does this mean? And what are you doing there? And like Elizabeth Bishop, who really hated that even more than he did, he just wanted to be an ordinary person because his, his um, creative life was something between him and his muse or him and his typewriter or him and his computer. So I, I could tell right away that I was not to ask questions about this kind of stuff to the great man. In 1988, I was coming to Stonington from New London to pick him up. We were going to take a plane to Block Island to visit some people whom we both knew. Uh, this is the late Clara Park, a writer at her husband, David Park, who was a physicist. And Clara had written about Jimmy and they had corresponded and they, they liked one another quite a great deal. And I remember pulling up to 107 Water Street. I'm sure he was, part of his politeness was that he was always on time. And he was sitting on the stoop like a, like a schoolboy waiting for the bus. And he was there with uh, a big hat and an enormous bag of stuff. And I said, Jimmy, we're only going over to Block Island you know, for the day. And he said, Willard, at my age, the pharmaceuticals and the cosmetics alone take up a whole bag. But he had come laden with, with gifts for the hosts. If by warm you mean fuzzy and welcoming and you know, like, a, like a grandmother, no. 
No, he was formal. He was formal and, and a little bit stiff and a little bit shy with strangers. But I'll tell you one thing, uh, the politeness paid off. He was, I don't think there will ever be a collection of this. He wrote the greatest thank you notes I've ever seen. Uh, and whenever he went anywhere, you know, to a dinner party at a university, he always wrote thank you notes and they always struck exactly the right tone. So he was brilliant at that. And that was a case not only of the manners he learned as a member of his aristocratic class, but also something that he liked doing and worked hard at and was even better at once he perfected the art. I, well, it, one doesn't know, or I certainly don't know, maybe there was some degree of shame, but I think he said to our friend Sandy McClatchy that he didn't want to be known as a professional sufferer. He, you know, he didn't want to be known as a, as a patient. Uh, he didn't want to be pitied. And you know, even at the end, when it was quite clear that he was dying, he was on his deathbed writing poems. Uh, and you know, the last volume is filled with poems that are redolent of mortality and death and dying, as would be the case of anybody of that age who is losing friends. When he died, Sandy McClatchy, as one of his executors, was going through all of the books at 107 Water Street. And he said, I knew that Jimmy was a graphomaniac. Maybe that's my term. He couldn't help himself from writing, writing all the time. And so Sandy said he would open any book and pages would come out, notes that he had made or things in the margin that he had scribbled down. Uh, he was always writing, always writing something. There's an early poem called The Doodler, which I called your attention. It's about a man with his uh, with a telephone, you know, uh, in the, in the crook of his neck, listening to somebody and writing with his other hand or making doodles. So he, that was multitasking before that was a word. <laughs> so Jimmy was always writing, and and Sandy said he would just open book after book, and pages would come out, a note, a comment, a fragment of a poem, a suggestion for something else. But then he knew he really struck pay dirt when he opened the poems of Dylan Thomas, a very unlikely poet for James Merrill to have, but there it was. And on the, uh, the title page, it said, the collected poems of Dylan Thomas, as a, you know, a title page will have. And underneath that in block letters in pencil, Jimmy had written the words, hot ladies man, H-O-T-L-A-D-Y-S-M-A-N an anagram of Dylan Thomas. He took the 11 letters of the name and he couldn't not make an anagram of it. And there it was, hot ladies man, which is a good uh, description of Dylan Thomas too, as well as a, you know, a good use of the letters. So it, it's that inventiveness, that not being able to let anything go. You, you remember what Henry James said, um, when somebody wrote him for advice, how do I be a great novelist? And Henry James wrote back and said, be one on whom nothing is ever lost. And nothing was ever lost on James Merrill.